I know you will like to sit down, but why don't we begin with, uh, <laughs> I just caught you off guard. Why don't we begin with this hymn that we have, we will be singing in closing, but I would like us to prepare. Uh, why do we stand in the presence of God when we read God's word? As a gesture of honoring God's word, right? And what is this gesture? Uh, maybe asking something, right? Give me or asking. Why don't we just ask the Holy Spirit to bless us with spiritual gifts, the revelation of the spiritual gifts, so that we may live for the glory of God. Amen? And that's why we are here. So let's begin with the Spirit of the Living God. Let's stretch our hands as a gesture of asking God. It is nothing like, you know, something wrong if I stretch my hands. Uh, why we clap? We are in appreciation. So these are some gestures as we do. Uh, we say, God, I'm just standing before you. Please bless me. So let's stretch our hands and ask God. <clears throat> be seated. <clears throat> now this diagram is just a reminder again that uh, we started talking about the early church and God's purpose through the church that God's purpose through the church is to bless all nations. Amen? Yes, and I need your strong amen. Otherwise, I'll be repeating myself, and I'll ask you to give a good one. So anytime I say amen, so you, you go for it, okay? Look for it. I may start another one. I may ask you to say hallelujah. Oh, it's, wow, yeah, it's becoming a Pentecostal church here. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> all right. Okay, it's not a bad thing. It's a scriptural thing. Many in the church have forgotten that we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus Christ, not just for that time, but to remain filled with the Holy Spirit if we want to grow in Christian discipleship. And that's what we were looking at. If you look at the center, it says, being filled with the Holy Spirit, loving God and loving others. You know, loving is also is a divine thing. We have our own limitations, capacities. We cannot love the way God loves. Only by the Holy Spirit we can do that. That's why we need to ask the Holy Spirit in everything we do, loving God, loving one another, doing anything. We as Christians have to and must understand that without the Holy Spirit, we are empty. Amen? Yes, that's where we are going with this. And we talked about five components, and I'm not going to uh, repeat the message. We have communion also today. Uh, but I would encourage you to go to our YouTube uh, for the last week's sermon, which we had uh, first uh, part one of serving the church of Jesus Christ with our spiritual gifts and talents. So today is part two, and you can see that um, yellow circle, your, I would say, 11 o'clock. You can look at 11 o'clock. Um, and then you can look at maybe 8 o'clock. Yeah, it's 8 o'clock using the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the edification of the body of Christ. That's where we are in these two weeks. Today is the second week. And I asked you last week, how many of you think that you have a spiritual gift? 
And I know that some of you have just joined today. So that's why I'm encouraging you to go to our first week, uh, last week's message, and see that we concluded that each one of us at least have one or more spiritual gifts. That is scripture. That's what, what we were talking about. So I am expecting from you, if you are not convinced yet, we are going to look at the scripture again. However, remember that. If you have forgotten, if you have never read in the scripture, if you don't know that you are spiritually gifted, the Holy Spirit has gifted you, not for your personal entertainment. Gifts are given to build up the body of Christ. Amen? It is not just for myself. It is to build up the body of Christ. So I asked you at least four questions. I said, how many of you know that you have a, a gift of the Holy Spirit or gifts of the Holy Spirit? Can you raise your hands? Then the second question was, those who raised their hand, how many of you know that what your gift of the Holy Spirit is? Can you raise your hand? Okay. Still, some, you, some are still there, not really know, and today we, we will be discovering that. And the third question was, those who know that they have a gift of the Holy Spirit, and they know which gift of the Holy Spirit, the question is, are you using the gift of the Holy Spirit that you know you have. How many of you will confidently say, yes, I am using the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the fourth category of people or the type of people, maybe you were not here last week, or uh, if you have come today, the first Sunday for you on this topic, maybe you are wondering what in the world you're talking about. I'm clueless. Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit, what is this all about? So that's why I'm saying, please go back uh, last Sunday's message. I know at least two people here, uh, those who have done their homework, they were not here last uh, Sunday. I talked with Julie Pelker, and she said, I have done the homework. She, she read the chapter. Oh, by the way, we had a homework too. Did you read four chapters? No? Okay, God's grace to you, okay? I really want to have that gift of grace today. No condemnation. Grace to you. We were talking about 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4. These chapters, easy to remember, uh, you know, just 12, 12, and 4, 4, uh, so that you can dig into that and see how many gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, are there and also try to understand or see and ask the Holy Spirit, what is my gift? So that was the homework for last week. Uh, but the main question was, even when we were looking at, if you were not convinced, I showed you these four passages. Each and every passage tells, especially for those who were not here last Sunday, or if you have not gotten the message, even after being here for two Sundays, you have not gotten the uh, message that when you are in Jesus Christ, you are gifted by the Holy Spirit. It is not just a gift of salvation. It's the gift to build up the body of Christ. And that's the reason God has placed those spiritual gifts in our lives for a purpose. Because he has a mission and God is accomplishing his mission through his church. And in the church, each and every one of us are part of the body of Christ, building one another and doing God's work. And, and, and I said to you, it is for the, to build up the body of Christ. And I said, it is also going to uh, keep us from two errors in the church or two evils I would say in the church some will, some will say I don't have a gift so they will try to avoid their participation in the church they will uh, not show up to uh, come to the services or be part of the church because they think I'm not very important there are only five or f six people or there are a bunch of people who are important in the church so I'm not important so that misunderstanding misconception or I will say the false teaching that you have bought into that will be dealt by receiving the word of God that I am gifted by the Holy Spirit. Amen? So each and every one of you are so important in the body of Christ. If you're not in the church, church is missing a significant impact, building up within the body of Christ an impact in the world. So turn to your neighbor and say, you are very important in the body of Christ. Just turn to you your neighbor and say basically saying don't miss 
Stay connected. Stay connected. The other evil I said that when we know that each and every church member, uh, uh, part of the body of Christ is gifted, then we will also be spared from another evil in the church where some people are gifted. You know, some people, even before they walk, their gifts are walking before them. I'm trust, just trying to create some sense of humor. It didn't work. <laughs> it worked this time. All right. What I meant to say means they're so much energized they are just running everywhere with their gifts. But the problem with that kind of person or personality is that you don't recognize other people's gifts. One side, people are just kind of denying whether they have gifts of the Holy Spirit. On the other side, some people are just bossing around and neglecting other people's gifts. That's why Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 if you want to look at that, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. You want another one? At the end, verse 40. Mark it down. It says that in the church there has to be order. It means you can have your gifts, but the church needs to have order. Amen? Now, you can have your spiritual gifts, but be sensible to other people's spiritual gifts too. And have order order in the body of Christ for the glory of God. So this, that's what we were looking at last week. And I, I said that God, when God designed the church, he wanted the church to be a body. He didn't want the church to be a stadium, a football stadium, a football game where 50,000 people who desperately need exercise sit on the benches and watch 22 men on the field who desperately need rest. That's what we were talking about last week, right? We are not a football stadium. And if you have bought into that, I would say you have bought into consumerism. What is consumerism? You're here to consume. No. The church is not a place for consumerism. And some people say, I didn't get anything of the service, get anything out of the service today, as if you're just coming here to get something out of it. We need to think differently, amen? We need to think, what can I give? That's why, you know, there was a famous saying, don't ask, I don't know who that was, don't ask what the country can do to you, ask what you can do for the country, you can tell me where that is. But this is that kind of understanding we need. Don't ask, you know, what the church is doing for you. Ask why God placed me here in the church. What can I do for the church? Amen? But ultimately, we are building each other up building up each other. We need one another. That's basically uh, the summary or the recap of last week's message. So let's not, don't, uh, don't fall into consumerism. Don't fall into that in a pity party that I'm nobody, you are very important. And don't fall into the trap of like, oh, I know, I have energy, I have gift for this and that. Slow down. You should not be slowing down, but be mindful, Amen. Be mindful how to have the order in the body of Christ. Now, I'm not telling you it's the word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 and verse 40 that talks about that. He said, I understand that you have gifts because the Corinthian church was a gifted church, but they were also very much problematic church because of the people, those who were creating problem in the body of Christ. So friends, we may have good intentions, but let's be mindful that this is the church of Jesus Christ. Let's move on to part two today. And what I'm going to do today, we are going to look at three things. One will be discovering. Second, discerning. The third, desiring. Discovering the spiritual gifts, discerning the gift, spiritual gifts, and desiring the spiritual gifts. First of all, why do we need to discover the spiritual gifts? Because when we know what our spiritual gift is, we have clarity of mind how God is using us, what is God's plan. Because if he has placed a, a spiritual gift in you, then he knows he has a purpose for you. Amen? Amen? Amen. If he gifted you with a spiritual gift, I'm losing you in between. Some of you are cooking at this time. Don't cook. Don't cook. You're planning a trip. Don't do that right now, please. I know, I know some of you are really into that. Some of you are planning something else. Stay here. Not just body, your mind, your spirit. Let's sing this song again. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Because this is, devil doesn't want this, I can tell you. 
You know, only the enemy of our soul, enemy of the church is not the government. Our f- spiritual warfare is not against the people, not the government. Our spiritual warfare is against the spiritual forces, right? If you know what your gift is, if you are acting out, functioning in full capacity of your gift, who is in danger? The enemy of our soul is in danger. Amen? He is trembling at this time because you gifted people of church, you are going to make the world upside down. You have that impact and that power. Amen? So let's, let's sing. You don't have to rise. Let's, let's stretch our hands and repent from our wandering around. Choir, just lead us. Fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Amen. All right. The first thing I want us to understand, why do we need to discover the spiritual gifts? Because some of you have been working for the church for long, right? And you are really pouring your lives into the church. I see that. I hear that. And I can witness that. You are very gifted people. You do whatever you can do in your capacity. But let me tell you, when you know what your spiritual gift is, it's a completely different matter because God has blessed you with a certain gift or gifts for his purposes. Let me just throw a story here, which I was tempted to speak last week, but we were running out of time. And that is a true story of someone I thought that he did not have this particular gift or that particular gift. I just kind of, you know, pushed him to do something which he was not designed by God to do. I'm telling you about a software engineer or a, not, why software engineer? He was not really a software engineer. He was a mechanical engineer who was, uh, you know, repairing all those uh, appliances and all those things. And he used to have a shop where I grew up, where my hometown was back in India, and uh, working in the local church and working in my teaching ministry, he was very much connected to me. And he would come to me, he was a businessman, he had his shop running, and he would come to me, he said, I want to do something for God, you know, there is some burning desire in me to do something for God. And I used to look at him as like a great donor. Because he has money, his shop is running, I told him, you have a gift of business. I didn't even see that in the scripture. I just threw that because I saw that he's a businessman and we need money in the church, right? Why don't you support the church with all that you do? But he would come back again and he would say, just pray for me or something. I really want to do something for God. But what most of the time my answer was, Maybe you have gift, that gift. I really could not see what God was doing in his life. When I look back, I'm confessing it in front of you all. Now, let me cut the story short. In winter months, somewhere in November, or I would say December until March, a lot of snowfall, most of the shops are closed, and if people are not from that town, they go home and they reopen their shop when the weather is getting better. I hope you understand some of the snowbirds here. You close down your house here and you go to Florida or Texas or Arizona. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. So he was like a snowbird, and then he would go and come back. And one in winter, he left and he did not come back. He came back maybe in May or June, and I was wondering and thinking about him and why he didn't come back, and he came back to close down his shop. You know what did he say to me when he met me? He said, when I went home with my wife, I started going out and praying for people. People started getting healed. There were some people who were demon-possessed. Now, demon possession is not a very popular word here, but I don't know what to say when people are going shooting in spree. What are they possessed with? 
Mental illness is one thing. I'll keep that aside. That is a real thing. But there are so many demonic forces. I'm not talking about mental illness. I'm talking about why people are going out as if demons have been released. Amen. If you are not a spiritual person, that's fine. At least buy into the scripture that our, our, our fight is not against the flesh and blood. Amen. There are spiritual forces. I can tell you there are some people who will tell that the evil one is telling me, go and shoot someone. Go and do this. Go and do that. I understand mental illness, but how would you explain a voice? Is this a good voice or an evil voice? Just tell me. It's an evil voice when someone is telling you to go and shoot people, shoot your family members, do evil stuff. We cannot just say that's just merely a mental illness, though we acknowledge that. But we need to understand higher realities of spiritual. We are spiritual beings, they are spiritual forces. Amen? That we must understand. That we must understand. <clears throat> where, are, where were we? So we, 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 were this, we were with this man. He told me, you know what happened later? He closed down his business. He went and he planted a church in his hometown. And here I was. Oh, you have a gift of business. Where do you find that? All I was seeing, just outward appearance and his shop and maybe his contribution to the church. And I repent and I confess my sin before you all. I'm still in, in connection with him. Okay, it's not like at back then. We started helping out his ministry. But the business part of it, he was gifted. He started a school. He was good in administration too. So who would have seen all those gifts? He was... A gifted person by the Holy Spirit. I could even see gift of prophecy in his life. Gift of healing. Gift of casting out demons. Those are like miraculous works he was doing there. And people started coming. And he started a home fellowship in his house. That is the work. I'm not talking about 1st century or 15th century. I'm talking about just 15-20 years ago. When he started doing that. He's still in ministry. So that is what I'm saying. When you discover your gift, what God has gifted you with, you might have, might have gone in your life so far with doing all the other things. But when you come to that point and you say, oh my God, you have gifted me for this. And the, the direction changes, amen? His direction changed. His location changed. That's what happens when we discover the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm not asking you to close down your business Stop going to your jobs. You can do all that unless God has really specifically called you to do something else. I had my personal agenda for my life. But when God called me to ministry, I knew and I knew and I knew that I need to keep my personal agenda aside. To do all that I wanted to do in the world. You become a big shot, you become this, you become that. Again, I'm not saying to you stop education, stop this or stop that until God speaks to you. But when God does speak to you, then come fully out and say, God, here I am. Amen? When does that happen? When you discover that you have been called by God for his purposes. The gifting that you have. You can do your job, but at the same time, you may have certain gifts along with the, the work that you're doing to earn, you are fully involved with those gifts to build up the body of Christ. Because spiritual gifts are not for your personal entertainment. Spiritual gifts are given to build up the body of Christ. Amen? How many of you are spiritually gifted here today? And those who have not raised hand, at least read the word of God that says that, each and every person in the church is spiritually gifted. Your homework will be now to discover that gift. Why? Because you may be just simply wasting your time. Wasting what God really wants to do in and through your life. And I'm not hesitating in speaking this. Why? Because when I hesitated... Or when I just did it with my own human understanding, I messed up. I messed up. 
But I praise God that this man was mindful of what God was doing and he was responding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Are you opening your heart to respond to the prompt of the Holy Spirit or do you just want to be a religious person? Oh, I have a personal religion. I am called Christian. There is no personal Christian religion according to the scripture. It's a gift from God for God's purpose. Not to make you feel good coming church. Oh, I have one leg here and I feel connected. That is not it. Amen? That's why I said religion never saves. Jesus saves. Coming to church doesn't save you. It's the fruit of your salvation, okay? It is not the means and the end of it. Second, we were talking about discovering how important. If, if all of us will discover what our gifts are, oh my goodness, this church is going to be revolutionized. Amen? This church will be a completely different church. I'm not talking about, okay, we are going to have so many numbers. I'm not care about number. All I care about whether we are functioning in the gifts that God has called us to do. When we are doing that, fruit is in God's hand. We need to be in God's hand first. Amen? When the church is in the will of God, functioning with the Spirit of God, in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, then we are doing what we need to do and just relax and enjoy and do that. Now, the second thing I wanted to say is about discerning. Discovering and discerning is not very different. However, I just wanted to make sure that we begin to discern. When we have a, a list of uh, spiritual gifts we see, um, Ephesians will give you some it will talk about maybe a five spiritual gifts or at least this is what, the, what God has given to the church, people with these kind of gifts, but then you will also add some other gifts along with that. Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, some people only stick to that and they say only these people are functioning, that's fine. No. Then you, then you also uh, look at Romans chapter 4 verse uh, 12 verses 4 to 8 you probably will see 7 there when you go to 1st Corinthians maybe you will get to 9 there are different scholars different uh, uh, Bible readers scripture readers they will come up with a list some even came up with 18 17 27 and 30 spiritual gifts and they have scriptural verses to back up that regardless whether they are 7 9 17 18 or whatever is in your list. Just remember, a spiritual gift is to build up the body of Christ. Another thing you need to remember, spiritual gifts are the spiritual gifts because without being gifted by the Holy Spirit, you will normally not be able to do that. That's why that's a special gift. If a gift of healing, you can't just go around doing healing until you are spiritually gifted to heal you can't just go on doing speaking in tongues if you're not uh, gifted by the holy spirit to speak in tongues you may not have a word of knowledge if you're not gifted by that spiritual gift so that's where we are going with this uh, so what, as we are looking at it we must understand that discernment help, helps us we begin to see that I begin to draw myself to this. I feel I'm spiritually gifted for this kind of gift. So as you are thinking about this, 1 Corinthians will have nine. You know, I'm not bringing everything on, uh, on the screen here, but I want you to look at the last one. What does it say? If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Now, being merciful is a call to everyone, right? It is not like some people should be merciful, others don't or should not. Jesus said, be merciful, Matthew 5, 7. Be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful, right? That is a spiritual quality. But when we talk about mercy being a spiritual gift, that means there are some people gifted by the Holy Spirit who have extreme mercy in their hearts. They bleed for people. Have you heard this? They bleed. They can't see other people in trouble. They, their heart is melting out. 
They may stop the vehicle on the way and start doing something which will be insanity for you to do. Get giving rights to people that you will say, what in the world you're doing? Because their heart cannot stop being merciful. They're specially gifted. I can, I can tell you about one lady back in Oxford. I'll leave her name out. She was bleeding for other people's needs. Especially homeless, she couldn't see them until she's able to give them a jacket if it's cold, until she's able to provide for them if they are hungry. She would go out and beyond to do something. That was gifting. Where other people were merciful, but they will not be restless. Are you following? I mean, it's in your veins. Does it make sense? I mean, it's like you can't, you can't rest until you do that. You're spiritually so passionate about doing that. Are you following what I'm saying? So when you discern, one of the things that you can see that if you haven't discerned a particular scripture, a spiritual gift, begin to see what makes you passionate. Remember, it is not about playing football. Now, football can be a good talent. You must have worked hard. But if you're not using it to build up the body of Christ, don't count it a spiritual gift. Some of you will say, oh, I'm a great musician. If you're playing music, the music can be a tool as a spiritual gift, but that's not a spiritual gift. You know why? If it's not being used for the building up the body of Christ. Am I clear on that? All four passages that we saw, the spiritual gift is always geared towards building up the body of Christ. Some of you may say, oh, I can do this, I can do that. That can be a tool until you use it to build up the body of of Christ am I making sense I can read one account uh, that will help you uh, what happens when people are passionate about uh, something about the spiritual gifts what happens an elderly widow restricted in her activities was eager to serve Christ after praying about this she realized she could bring blessing to others by playing the piano the next day, she placed this small ad in the Oakland tri Tribune. Pianist will play hymns by phone, daily for those who are sick and despondent. The service is free. When people called, she would ask, what hymn would you like to hear? Within a few months, her playing has brought cheer to several hundred people. Many of them freely poured out their hearts to her, and she was able to help and encourage them. Now, what was her spiritual gift? Gift of encouragement. Music was a tool. Are you following what I'm saying? Don't just say, I'm talented in this, I'm talented in that. Unless you use that talent to edify, to build up the body of Christ, don't call that a spiritual gift. The spiritual gift was to encourage. How many of you got it? Amen? You may be having a gift of encouragement. I know many of our church members, they have gift of serving. Oh my goodness, they are just laying their lives to do anything they are called to do day or night. You are out there, out there in the yard, out there in the field, out there visiting people. Some of you have pastoral gift. Now pastoral gift doesn't mean that you have to be a pastor. Pastor can be a role, it's a role. But there are pastoral gifts. That means you like to visit with people, care for them. That's a pastoral gift. There's a position here, the pastor's position with teacher. Pastor and teacher comes together most of the time. However, there was a couple, again, in another church, and I know there are some couples here who have pastoral gifts. What they do? They go around visiting people, sitting with them, talking with them. They are not pastors officially, but they have pastoral gifts. Are you following what I'm saying? So you may be having gift of encouragement, gift of serving. You, you may be having a pastoral gift, not being a pastor, but pastoral gift. And then there are some who, who are spending more time in prayer, intercession. They have a special gift of intercession. Amen? That's a spiritual gift that you stand in the gap. So as we discern, think about what how you, what you're passionate about you. Is this in your vein that you really want to do it and you see how it's going to build up the body of Christ? First, see what you're passionate about. Second, I would say to you, as I, I, I told you about this lady, she started simply 
you know, trying it out. The second I would say, try it out. If you don't know what's your gift, try it out. Arlen, Arnel, Arlen Reynolds, are you here? Arlen is here. Arlen was there first time doing the liturgist last week. When I looked at Arlen last week, in my one year, I had not seen Arlen come forward and do our liturgist, be our liturgist. I had to literally hold Arlen by her hand, right, Arlen? It was hard for her to step up here. However, she was trying out. You know why? Because somebody had told her, you have a beautiful voice, and she does. She can do it. And that's like a gift for encouragement for us, right? Somebody comes, and, and, and Keith is doing that, and others are doing what you're using. Maybe you are not sure yet, but you're trying out. There is a saying, you can't steer a parked car. Shall I speak again? You can't steer a parked car. Some of you are sitting, I don't know what my gift is. Come on, start moving. Amen? Don't be a parked car. It's only going to harm the tires if you start steering there. You can't steer a parked car. That is the second way you discern and discover your gifts. You start doing it. Try it out. And I'm, uh, I was talking with Brenda and maybe somebody else that we need to have, and I think with a... Sometimes I can forget people's names. Carol Perry. I said we need to have a mission or a ministry Sunday where all our ministries will be displayed at Great Hall. Ministry leaders can have their stalls and introduce what they're involved in. Let the church members go around. Try it out. Amen? Try it out. Get involved. But don't just sit like a spectator. Do it. Go out until you discover and discern what God has placed in your life. If you don't do that, the church cannot move forward. Amen? Let's join... Uh, who said amen here? Pete. Let's join Pete. Amen? amen? Yes. So try it out. If it's in your way, go for it. Do it. But try it out and see where it takes you. But don't just sit because you can't steer a parked car. And I want to hear from you or I want to see you moving out now doing something. I know there are physical limitations, health, aging, all those things are there. But I gave you an example of this elderly lady. In her capacity, whatever she could do, she wanted to do, and God used her among several hundred people. Each one of you are a dynamite. Just turn to your neighbor and say you are a dynamite. What does a dynamite do? It has the power to blow. You can blow so many things by the gift you have. So stay encouraged. Stay encouraged. The third thing I want to say to those who have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they are not stirred. You're not using them. You know they are there, but you're not using them. You're just keeping them there. I'm going to give you one scripture. Apostle Paul left Timothy in Ephesus. When he left Timothy in Ephesus to do uh, God's work there, Timothy was not using his spiritual gifts. Let's read together. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did as I continually remember you in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see you, remembering your tears that I may be filled with joy, remembering the genuine faith the first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and that I am persuaded lives in you. Verse 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you by the laying on of my hands, there are some people you need to stir up that gift. 
You need to stir up that gift because that God has given you that gift. I just want to conclude this with this scripture that I have. On the one hand, scripture tells you that it is the gift, it's the Holy Spirit that gives you gifts, right? But at the same time, Apostle Paul tells you that desire greater gift. Greater gift basically means gifts that will edify the body of Christ and bring glory to God's name. 1 Corinthians 14 says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. How many of you like to be a prophet? Not many of us, right? But let me clarify to you, the gift of prophecy is not what you think a gift of prophecy is. Gift of prophecy is not merely predicting the future. Gift of prophecy, verse 3 says, but the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. And I want, as Apostle Paul says, that all of us may grow in the gift of prophecy, in strengthening, encouraging, and comforting people. When you read uh, do a word study of the gift of prophecy or the word prophecy. Prophecy means two things. Foretelling is one. Forthtelling. Forthtelling is not a prophecy. Forthtelling means the revealed character and the word of God you speak into people's lives to encourage them, to strengthen them, to comfort them. And that's what I think. If you are thinking, you know, I don't know what gift I have, you ask God, God, give me the gift of prophecy so that I can encourage people comfort people strengthen people amen so if you have misunderstanding about the gift of prophecy I clarify to you now let us rise let us stand in the presence of God and ask God let's sing that spirit of the living God fall afresh in me and let's rededicate our lives before we go into the Lord's Supper Let's rededicate our life and say, Lord, I repent of my stubbornness or my ignorance or my disobedience, but help me to stir up the gifts in me, to discern the gifts in me, to try out the gifts in me for your glory. Let's do it together. <clears throat> seated. Now I would like to invite you to the Lord's table and I would like the servers to please come forward. As we come to the Lord's table, let us remain in the attitude of prayer, repenting of our sins, coming to God, asking God to forgive us.